I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 17th of August, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, a number of my readers have expressed concern that Nicaragua is such a paradise, and if we're not careful and we keep promoting it, is there a real risk that it is going to turn into another Costa Rica? And that is a good question. We're gonna get to that right after the bump. To really ad address today's question, we have to actually start by talking a little bit about Costa Rica and what has happened there because you have to have that backstory to understand what the concern is from people. A number of years ago, Costa Rica was a sleepy little beautiful Central American destination and a lot of people started to discover it and go there quite a bit and it's always had tourism and ecotourism as major components of its uh, economy and that they focused very heavily on this and they did a wonderful job of taking um, environmental protections and making that into something that they had as a, a reason for coming to visit them. They, they kind of invented ecotourism. I don't know if they actually did, but they pioneered it to a great degree. And uh, we, we applaud Costa Rica for this incredible work that they did in that way. So Costa Rica has always been very special because it has such a focus on sustainability and the environment and, and jungle and animal preservation and all that. And it's when you go there, you really feel it. You sense that it's, it's fantastic. Um, but Costa Rica has, has, while doing some really great things, having no military, uh, having this great tourism infrastructure, amazing airports, those things led to some other problems. So you have to remember Costa Rica kind of stands out as a very unique entity. It is the only country like this in the region. Panama, which borders it to the east, has a little bit of a tourism industry and is a very nice safe place, uh, but it doesn't really focus on tourism the same way as Costa Rica. And it's hard for it to do so because of the canal and other things it just it has a very different vibe and when you get to the the north of Costa Rica heading to the rest of Central America you have a region that has been plagued for one reason or another by being either uh, adversarial with the United States which causes a lot of people not to want to go there for vacation or at least causes the United States to work really hard to pressure people not to go there for vacations or tourism or whatever. And then north of that is a region that is traditionally relatively dangerous, improving, fixing a lot of things, some amazing stuff going on. But there are areas where tourism is a lot less for more or less natural reasons. What this did was leave Costa Rica standing out as an amazing tourist destination with a lot of tourism resources and a huge amount of effort put into promoting tourism in an area where it's surrounded by basically no competition. Its nearest real competition is Cancun, Mexico, which is a completely different animal and a lot of dogs barking at me today. And it is one of the very few destinations of any size uh, and one of the very few places that would be considered exotic by any standards that is within an easy flight of the United States. And so that leaves it with a massive tourism market, much like Cancun has, that is very cheap uh, for travel, very uh, accessible, and it is very friendly with the United States. So the United States very much promotes travel to and from Costa Rica. Because of all this, Costa Rica went from, yes, an interesting tourist destination to one of the most simple, knee-jerk, overrun, completely over-traveled destinations you can imagine. The country is now completely dependent on tourism. It has very little else going on. It is overrun with tourists. They are absolutely everywhere. The entire country is now focused on tourism because it has to be. Essentially, it is, it is extremely difficult to work in any other sector due to the very strong needs of the tourism sector. If you go and work in another sector, you are taking jobs away from an area where they need it for uh, the import of business. And there just aren't a lot of resources for other things. Of course, other things do exist. There is manufacturing and stuff like anywhere, but the amount of it, the opportunities for people outside of tourism are very low. So Costa Rica has really become a one-trick pony, which was extremely problematic during COVID that uh, their economy simply came to a halt and 
there was nothing to back it up. Whereas other places like Nicaragua were in a position where yes, tourism was significant, but it was not the primary. And they were able to shift gears pretty quickly and simply move things around in the economy. And for the most part, weathered that storm fairly well. But the real concerns are not that you're gonna become a one-trick pony economy. That's a serious concern, but it's not, it's not a critical one. Costa Rica weathered that okay and is now recovering as the tourism industry floods back and it's one of the few places that's very easy to get to once again. But what's really the bigger concern is that Costa Rica has become, for all intents and purposes, a small American enclave to the point that many people think of it if they don't say it, but they're thinking it's like a colony. People speak English very broadly. The housing prices are similar to that in the United States. The cost of everything is close to that in the United States. And that means that the people who live there, Costa Ricans, like the actual people who live there, uh, are now struggling to be able to afford to live in their own country because there are so many Americans and the Americans who are traveling to places like Costa Rica are very often those who can afford to travel internationally uh, comfortably, right? If you go to, um, destinations within the United States and say, well, what kind of Americans are here? Well, by and large, they're average Americans. But when you go to an international location and say, what kind of Americans are here? It's, well, they're above average Americans by income, typically. And so Costa Rica has above average American income families in unbelievably large numbers that, that really show up in, as a part of the overall population. Costa Rica has a population of just a little over 5 million and with hundreds of thousands or possibly millions of tourists in the country and tourists including expats and those who are relocating and digital nomads and long-term stays or whatever there's a, a large range of who goes there but a ton of them are expats the number of people who are going there to stay and to live to buy property is really really high and so the result has been that the cost of everything is completely dictated by that large buying group, the Americans coming with their deep pockets of the above average Americans and buying houses often at American prices because they're not worried about the price. They're not trying to, you know, in a normal economy, people are haggling over the price of a house. And, you know, maybe here in Nicaragua, a house is worth $100,000. And if you're an expat and you come here and you wanna buy a house, Sure, you might overpay. You may even pay $150,000 and feel like you got a good deal. But the locals will be like, haha, they overpaid. But you're not going to overpay at a quarter million or a half million dollars for that house very often. Some people do, and there's been scams where people really got taken advantage of. But by and large, that's not going to happen. You're going to pay just a little bit, a little get gringo rate on top of the, the regular rates, and the market is going to stay more or less normal. But in Costa Rica, what we've had happen is that so many people are are buying houses at nonsensical prices, that the housing market has escalated to being basically an American housing market. It's still slightly cheaper, and that keeps driving it forward because the country is so small that the number of Americans who are available to potentially buy second or third houses in Costa Rica is essentially endless. Remember, the United States has nearly 350 million people, Costa Rica about 5 million. That's a difference of 1 to 70. That's crazy. If one out of every 70 Americans were to buy a house in Costa Rica, and think about it, if you know 70 people, there's a possibility that one of them will have bought a house in Costa Rica. That means that there are as many houses owned by Americans as there are Costa Ricans to potentially buy a house. And most people don't buy houses, right? Children, retirees, you know, families, they're only using one house. So you it's nowhere near that number. There's nowhere near 5 million homes in Costa Rica. So because so many Americans are there, it completely drives the market. And it's not just housing. Food costs way more. Coffee costs way more. Services cost way more because people are pricing things to service the American tourist. And while they still want a deal compared to the United States, they don't really know what a good deal is. And this is true going to any foreign country. If you come here to Nicaragua and you say, well, I'd like to buy a cup of coffee. You don't know if it should cost 10 cents, 50 cents, a dollar, $3, $5, $10, right? Until you get used to the market, you're not sure when you're getting a good deal or not. Uh, and it's easy to say, oh, this is, this is gonna be $1.50 and really the price was 75 cents. Most people won't notice. They'll still think, oh, that's not as cheap as I was led to believe, but it's so cheap that I don't care. 
right? And I lost 75 cents. But if you did that regularly and the prices were adjusted because of it, you would have a situation where it only made sense to sell coffee at $1.50. And the locals who were struggling to, not that they couldn't buy a cup of coffee, but to make buying a cup of coffee a regular thing, would say, I can't afford coffee anymore. It now costs twice as much. And that extra 75 cents to an American who's only visiting for a few weeks or a few months doesn't add up that much. It's a tiny part of their income and it's a tiny part of their overall time. But to a Nicaraguan, it is a larger part of their income and all of their time. And so the ec economics of the higher prices is really impactful to the locals who have to live with the then increased prices. So in Costa Rica, what has happened is that the price of everything has shot up to such a degree that they now depend on the Americans or other tourists who come there to spend foreign income in their country in order to afford to buy and sell things, leaving the people who are actually the actual Costa Ricans, the Ticans, do not have the resources under normal circumstances to be able to afford their own services and their own goods in their own country. And it has made living there extremely difficult for them. And so they're, they're increasingly living in more and more uh, squalor houses. Whereas, whereas here in Nicaragua, people are consistently living in better and better homes as time progresses. In Costa Rica, people are constantly living in worse and worse homes as time goes on, as their ability to afford goods in their own country decreases. So that's really important that Nicaragua, uh, people who are watching my channel are seeing a country where we expect there to have been, that dog surprised me, uh, we expect there to have been a uh, financial crisis in the past. People have struggled to afford things traditionally. How are you? Look at you. Look how cute you are. He's a little bit angry. We have this expectation that people will be struggling to afford things. And when we see people with nice houses, we say, oh, wow, things are better than we expected. And they're constantly getting better. And when we look at Costa Rica, we go, oh, people aren't able to afford the things that we picture as Costa Rica. That's just Americans. The Costa Ricans are increasingly having to sell their homes because they can't afford to stay in them and having to move to smaller homes or share with family. So that situation is currently what exists in Costa Rica. And there's no end in sight. Things are very, very bad for those who actually live there. And honestly, it has made it a not very attractive tourist destination in many ways. And that could be its long-term saving grace, but not likely. Once real estate costs go up and people have spent a lot of money, they tend to be unwilling to unload in the future without getting their money back, at least to some degree. And so there's a very real possibility that Costa Rica is looking at a very long time to recover where many of their properties end up going empty and no one wants to sell what they have without getting a price that no one is willing to pay and then they will have real problems. But before then, they are simply overrun with tourists, which has made them, for a lot of people, much less attractive. For a lot of us, we don't wanna go there because it isn't fun traveling to a place that's kind of like Nicaragua, but completely full of Americans, and is kind of the same food as Nicaragua, but priced like you're in the United States. That takes a lot of the fun out of living in another location. And if your goal is to experience another culture, you're not going to experience it very well when you're in an entire country that has turned into an enclave. That is a huge overstatement. There are large swaths of Costa Rica that remain undeveloped and remote and small villages and not Americanized in any way, but the, they are not parts you typically end up in. I hope you can hear the band in the background. This is the girls' colegio that I'm walking past. And this is actually, I'll note, uh, this is not the branch, but this is actually the high school that uh, Marcella from the show, she graduated from this one right here, just not this this specific location of the school. I have a lot of traffic today. This is making the, the show a bit of a challenge, especially because I don't have the lavalier working right now. And so everybody's out on their motorcycles making as much noise as they possibly can. Costa Rica has lost its charm in many ways. A great number of people who traditionally would go to Costa Rica are now disenchanted with it because they, they are not being able to get, their money doesn't go far like it used to. People who started going there long ago, many of them did it because it was a very affordable destination. It was a very accessible destination, but it still allowed them to get out and be part of a different culture. It let them experience something exotic, something interesting. And now because it is essentially a small American enclave, a lot of that interesting has fallen away. A lot of that exoticism is gone. And that's nice if you're looking for a place you don't mind not saving very much money. It's still cheaper than staying home typically. But if you're if you're okay just going to a place and, and being able to say, yes, I technically 
left the United States, I now use a different currency. I now use kilometers instead of miles. And that's all you're looking for is those really simple things, but you still want the taste of home. You still want to be able to speak English most of the time. You still want everything to look and feel like you're in the United States with just the tiniest bit of Central American flavor, then yes, Costa Rica is going to be great for you. And it really does make a nice soft introduction to traveling internationally. But it's become kind of a halfway house for travelers, for people who want to say they've gone out of the United States, but don't actually want to do it if they can help it. You have to have your passport, but it's kind of a token thing. So that's kind of where Costa Rica is. Now, all that said, that was a long explanation. What are the risks, because so many people are discovering Nicaragua, that Nicaragua is going to turn into Costa Rica, just the next one? So first, the reasons that Nicaragua are not like Costa Rica are pretty straightforward. First of all, it is a significantly larger country, both in population and in land area. So whether you're having a real estate situation where people are just buying a lot of land or you're affecting a percentage of the population, in both cases, it is much harder to affect Nicaragua than it is Costa Rica. That's the first piece. The second piece is Nicaragua is not aligned with the U.S. and there's no chance that it is going to be in the future. Its history has been one of non-alignment with the United States since the adversarial interactions with the United States in the early-ish to mid-1800s. The United States has always seen Nicaragua as a place to be conquered, not a place to, to partner with, and that is absolutely never going to change. No matter what Nicaragua does, the United States will never view them after nearly 200 years, there's no chance that Americans are going to change their view and look at Nicaragua as a potential partner in the region. And so Nicaragua is always going to remain poorly listed by the State Department. There's always going to be propaganda in the U.S. discouraging people from traveling here. There are never going to be really excellent uh, mechanisms for going back and forth. Yes, we have direct flights from the United States to down here. That's not going to change very likely, but that's not that significant. But easeability of other things, of, of moving money back and forth or whatever, is going to remain not bad, but not as fluid as Costa Rica. It's just never going to happen. So that alone is going to discourage a lot of things. We also have a very different starting point that Costa Rica was quite a bit more expensive than Nicaragua for a very long time and always had a lot more tourism. So the starting point when Nicaragua went down this path was one of being at high risk of this happening and Nicaragua starting down this path, which is not exactly something to say because it's not starting down any path. But if you were to think of it in that context, Costa Rica was starting from a way ahead of the pack out of the, the gate lead on having these kinds of things happen. And Nicaragua is not just starting from the standard starting point, it's starting from way behind. When you're concerned, is Nicaragua going to be the next Costa Rica? Realistically, that doesn't make any sense at all. The countries that are more likely to be, if there was going to be a next Costa Rica, and there could be, right, but that those countries would be Panama first, El Salvador second, Honduras or Guatemala third or fourth. And of course, Belize is a little bit different, but is somewhere in that mix, probably behind El Salvador and ahead of Honduras and Guatemala. All of those we would expect to become the next Costa Rica before it happened to Nicaragua. Given that it took decades or a century for the 5 million people of Costa Rica to be overrun in this way, if it was truly to continue and the factors in other countries being less perfect for it to happen, but still better than Nicaragua, and it was to slowly march through the region as a constant spread of American enclaveness throughout the region, we would expect that the 5 million people of Costa Rica would be followed by the 3 million, 7 million, 24 million, 8 million of all those other countries long before the 6.5 million of Nicaragua were swept along in the same way. And so if it took many decades, possibly a century, of people going to Costa Rica in this way for Costa Rica to become overrun like it is today, given how much massively larger the combined countries in the region, Panama is smaller, but it would just be part of the larger group, all of those would have to have this happen to them before it got to Nicaragua. So even if that was the tr if it was truly just a forward march and nothing turned it around, we would be looking at probably two or three hundred years before the same thing happened down here. And that's if population trends don't change because currently the population in Central America is growing while not super fast, it is growing and the population in the United States is expected to curtail. And so the ability for the United States to overrun the region will slowly diminish. It may last for millennia if nothing else changes, but it will be diminishing, not increasing. And that's an important factor too. 
So it's important to note that in any country, any region, anywhere in the world, there is the possibility of there being too many tourists. And this is happening everywhere, including Europe, which has a larger population than the United States and is very rich, but not currently as rich as the United States. They have places that are overrun with tourists, Barcelona being a key example, or some of the islands in Greece like Santorini. So they, these things exist and happen even in places where tourism is a very small part of the general economy. Europe is a massive population region, and while tourism is important there, it is not that big in reality. They have loads of uh, service industry and uh, manufacturing and just everything, right? It's a huge blended economy and they still have those problems. So those problems can exist anywhere and will always exist somewhere. So I don't wanna say that there's no chance of it happening or that it's going to be incredibly isolated, but Nicaragua is no, in no way at risk of being like Costa Rica until basically the entire planet is overrun with tourists, which could happen. That is a thing that they're fearing that we are ending up in a world where people have enough leisure time and enough resources and the cost of travel diminishes enough that basically the whole planet becomes people just moving around looking at different things. And that's a real probability at some point but it's important to note that Nicaragua will be very low on that list. It is not a big tourism destination, American or otherwise. So where we fall into that risk pool is in no way the next country. Now, what's really important is that uh, in any country, you want a certain amount of tourism. No one wants no tourism. That doesn't really make sense. Even very isolated places like North Korea wish they had a little bit more tourism. Tourism brings in outside dollars and is very handy for the economy and is very good for a lot of other reasons in general. So you want to have a certain amount of tourism. That's just a given. Nicaragua wants to have more than it does. So here's where we need to look at things. In all cases, countries have kind of a desired threshold of tourism and a number that's perfect. And if you have less than that, well, you wish you had more because you'd earn more money for your people. You'd increase your economy, be able to provide more services without taxing your own people. That's good. But you don't want to go too high. So there's a number you don't want to extend to because you end up with things starting to cost too much for the locals. Basically, you create tourism fueled inflation and you start having things like the housing market struggle because you have foreigners buying the properties instead of the locals. So there's always a kind of a desired rate and it varies by country based on a lot of factors. Factors, uh, in that country. At this point, Costa Rica has way more tourists than they wish that they had, at least of certain types. They pretty much always wish that some super rich people who don't want to buy property would end up in the country because those are the people who end up uh, putting a lot of money in and taking very few resources out. So there's always someone who's desired, but in a great many cases, uh, there are uh, people that are there that they wish were not because they are only doing things that are kind of hurtful to the environment, but you can't exactly pick and choose really easily. You have to do lots of different uh, economic incentives to try to encourage or discourage different groups of people in the hopes of getting a good blend and a good total number. So quality and quantity, you hope, work out to a number that is great for your economy. So when people are saying, I'm worried about the promotion of Nicaragua, for example, because what if it becomes overrun in the future? Maybe we should keep it a secret and tell no one about it. Well, there's some value to that, but I also worry that it may be disingenuous. So be very careful of people who say this. It can be coming from a very honest place, but it can also be coming from a selfish place, and sometimes it can be coming from a destructive place. So I wanna talk about this real quickly. The people who have an honest concern, most likely they've looked at Costa Rica and they say, but I see Nicaragua is having the same general vibe. It has the same general physical location. It has the same general size and population. There's a bunch of general similar, right? They share a big border. They used to be the same country. There's a lot of reasons why you would associate the two. And for a lot of people who are in Costa Rica, they're starting to look at Nicaragua as an option because it's so close and so similar in many of the ways that they like and dissimilar in the ways that they don't. Well, that makes it a very logical choice and you can see why people would jump to this conclusion and then say, well, this bad thing happened to Costa Rica because of it. I don't wanna do that to someone else. What do we do? So there's a very honest potential for wanting to be worried about this. There's also, in a lot of people have said this, a very selfish one where they say, I like Nicaragua as it is. I like the prices that they currently have. I'm not really concerned, not that they want bad things for other people, but that's not what they're thinking about. What they're thinking about is, are the housing prices gonna stay low for me? Are the taxes gonna stay low for me? Is the cost of goods and services gonna stay low for me? 
And as tourism increases, yes, those things could get more expensive in theory. And if you're someone who is visiting or an expat living in the country, you may see over time the cost of things that you are spending money on increase. And there's a pretty good chance that that will happen. So there could be this selfish look where someone is saying, I want to hold back the local economy in the hopes that it'll benefit me a bit more than it would otherwise. And this, while is just, you know, human nature, oh, I really hope my prices don't go up. It is negative to the people who live here because that portion of the inflation, that increase in the costing uh, uh, prices of things is a reflection in the early stages of an increasingly healthy economy. Remember, Nicaragua is a very poor country with a very depressed economy. And so prices are low, not because they are naturally low, but because there is a lack of jobs. There is a lack of people in the housing market and that has resulted in depressed prices. So for the good of the Nicaraguan people, we want those things to be coming up a little bit in price, not because we want them to pay more, but because we want them to come up in price naturally as the economy rebounds and there are people buying houses and there are people working jobs and there are people doing things that then have money to go buy things. And so people are not desperately lowering their prices trying to get anyone to buy things, but instead having a healthy competitive environment where lots of people are working and people are making money doing lots of different things. So for the good of the people who live here, we want that amount of growth. So there, you gotta be careful that there's a lot of people who put out this feeling, ooh, be, wear, be wary, keep it to yourself. We don't want the prices to go up and they don't mean because it'll cause a Costa Rican problem. They mean because they want to keep it as cheap as they can for themselves. So watch out if that's what people are saying. And I realize that a lot of people are saying that and it, you know that's a completely honest thing. We're not looking to hurt anybody, but you know, there's benefits for us too. We shouldn't go out of our way to hurt ourselves, right? I get it. Then there's a third group, and this is a constant thing. If you watch my show, and I've mentioned it, we are always getting people uh, who are quite obviously getting paid somewhere to put information out that is less than honest. So the selfish thing, that's honest, right? It's, look, look, I don't want my prices to go up. I get it, that makes sense. But then there's another group who say, ooh, you don't want to let, Co let Nicaragua start to act like Costa Rica. Look at what damage that will do to them. Oh, you have to like, keep it a secret to protect them from themselves. That's, that's colonialism. That's the voice. You have to isolate an economy and only let them interact when you let them interact, hide them from the world, hide the world from them, control their flow. That is exactly what the high level of colonialism is. That is the prime directive in Star Trek, right? Ooh, we found a people who are not advanced enough. Instead of interacting with them as equals, we're going to encapsulate isolate and forcibly make all of our trading partners not trade with them so we maintain them as a zoological exhibit and keep their prices down so that when we vacation there our money goes ridiculously far we can guarantee that our beads and wampum will still be which we can pick up in unlimited quantities for no money will be treated as money and we can be rich without spending any money and people won't realize that we have an endless supply of these things because they don't know where we're getting them from right? It's this keeping it secret thing. There's a very, very strong group with a lot of backing behind it, creating this propaganda to try to make you think that you might be doing a good thing by avoiding letting the word get out about the reality of Nicaragua. Oh, there's actually affordable houses. Oh my gosh, it's actually really safe. It's actually a beautiful place to go vacation. It's a great place to become an expat. It's a great place to digital nomad. There's all these benefits. There's all these great things. You don't want to know about that because you'll destroy the country by flooding people in there. That is not how that works. The reality of the situation is, is that Nicaragua is in a position where it is starting to do much better. Its economy is improving well, and a great investment into infrastructure and education and other things is paying off. But those things take a very long time. It's not gonna happen overnight, but they are a showcase of how good government policies have allowed for strong, stable economic growth that is slow and steady, but truly doing a good job. But it takes a really long time for those economic factors to turn 
turn the country around. And it's certainly showing that it is working and the stuff that's happening is brilliant. But that doesn't change the fact that there is a high degree of unemployment. That is the number one crisis in the country. So there are endless jobs that need to be created so that people can go to work. And that does not create economic crisis. People like to pretend that it might, especially because they don't think about it, but it does not create the same thing as raising, for example, the minimum wage. If you have a country where 100% of the people work, but they all work at $1 per hour, and you raise the minimum wage to $2 per hour, you have doubled the total amount of pay going into the nation. And what you've done is made every individual person able to spend twice as much money as they could the day before. And so in doing so, you typically see a lot of inflation. Goods and services get a lot more expensive because everybody has twice as much money to spend. And, and that's what we see typically in the United States. So when we're talking about increasing minimum wage in the US, that is what's, what, what people are concerned about, right? I'm not making an argument for or against minimum wage. I am simply explaining why Americans have this feeling naturally, because Americans have extremely low unemployment. Meaning if you want to work in America, chances are you're working. The number of people who are out of work, who truly want to work and have any desire to actually show up and do a decent job, Basically, you're going to work. Those people are not wondering where their next job is going to come from. Once in a while, it's a struggle to find the next gig, but there is work for people willing to be flexible and willing to work almost always. But in Nicaragua, you can be super honest, super hardworking, have great references, and there just aren't enough jobs to go around. And so there's a lot of really great potential employees lacking in jobs, especially because so many jobs that could be here require you to speak English and so few people do. So that's one thing. If everyone spoke English, the, in, the entire economy would change overnight. But so when you raise the average pay of the average person and nearly everyone is working, you get inflation almost always. Everything just goes up in price because the people who are like, oh, I, I couldn't afford to go out yesterday can go out today. Clubs are now full, restaurants are now full. And what do they do to uh, you know, limit the number of people who are going there? Do they simply keep making the same money as they always did, but paying out twice as much? Remember their employees make more money. Uh, so they gotta come, that has to come from somewhere. How do they do it? Well, they're full already. They can't make more money by putting out more seats. So they have to slow the, reduce the line of people trying to come in by raising the price and earning more per table. And so you naturally get, and that's just one example, right? But that happens across the economy, you get inflation. Here in Nicaragua, it's the opposite. We don't have enough people with jobs. So if every other person is making $2, and you then add more jobs. You're not taking the people who were spending money yesterday and suddenly making them able to go out and spend way more money. They don't have a huge surplus of money. You're simply taking people who were sitting at home doing nothing. You're taking people who had no money, were not putting food on the table and giving them the ability to go out and do things. Could there still be inflation? Of course, at some point, you're gonna hit a threshold where you're still gonna to start to get inflation, but it is not the same effect at all. The individual people do not see an excess increase in money. You simply see people go from unemployed to employed. And so the people who were making acceptable money yesterday are still making acceptable money today. They're not going to put up with a real change in overall cost of goods and services. And the people who were doing nothing before will simply start taking advantage of those goods and services to some degree, but they have a lot of catch up to do because they probably have debts and they have uh, uh, you know, needs for, they've probably been without houses, they've probably been without cars and they gotta figure that out. Uh, so they have a long, long rubber banding effect once they start getting paid. So that's where Nicaragua is. So the thing that we're concerned about here is actually that we want to create jobs. We're not trying to raise the individual employment uh, amounts. We're trying to keep people who are currently starving or struggling and can't do anything. They can't afford uh, to go anywhere. They can't afford to travel. They can't afford to eat. They can't afford whatever. We want to take those people and make them able to participate in society the same as everyone else. We're gonna walk a little bit away from the road. We're in rush hour, so it's getting really loud over here. I'm gonna take a moment and show you where I'm walking because it's just gorgeous. So that first really big factor is the unemployment. We're not increasing the amount people get paid. We are decreasing unemployment when we create new jobs. The other piece is when people buy houses. And I think this is the bigger concern from people in the audience who say, well, okay, Maybe employment's good, make as many jobs as you want, but clearly when people start buying houses, the prices of houses goes way up. That's just how it works, right? And that's 
really not true either. So that's true in Costa Rica's sense because their market is saturated with buyers. It is a competitive market where there are not enough houses to go around. Here in Nicaragua, that is so far from being the case. We have the problem that the uh, market has collapsed to such an incredible degree that there are empty houses everywhere. And while there are people who would like to move into them, in some cases, there's by and large simply not enough people to go into the available houses. And the nature of things is that people tend to live multi-generationally in a single house. I think that was a word, multi-generationally in a single house. And uh, because of that, there is so much of the housing market absorbing the labor market. And so many people have left to go look for work in other countries that it has left the country with a shrinking population and a very outsized housing market. So the houses that are here are in many cases simply falling apart because they're not being maintained. They are desperate to get more buyers into the economy so that more people can, or more houses can have people in them and improving them. And there's lots of open space. So if there's a slight amount of construction needed to service some of that, that's not a problem. So all of that could be real positive. And every time a house sells, that's money going into the economy that can help grow the economy and make things more healthy rather than having their economic powerhouse of beautiful properties and locations sitting empty and simply attritioning out. So at some point, if so many buyers were to come into the market and try to buy houses, yes, eventually it would start raising the prices, but it is so far from that number. It's such, if you lived here, you would understand it is such an absurd thing to say because first of all, the, first, the number of people we can encourage to move down here is very small. Right? Yeah, I know this channel seems like it has a huge outreach and maybe it does compared to other things, but even if every single viewer of our channel, uh, not just every viewer of this channel, but every person who casually views this channel, every single of the hundreds of thousands of people who see it every month were to suddenly pack up and move to Nicaragua, would we notice? Yes, but could Nicaragua absorb it with the available houses on the market today? Yeah, it actually could. And we're never gonna get even 0.1% of that. In reality, we may be looking at encouraging just through, you know, exposing the country and getting the word out there, we may be encouraging hundreds of people, maybe at an outside number, a thousand people to move to Nicaragua, which is a number that greatly positively impacts the economy of the country because each person brings a lot of spending with them, a lot of investing with them especially as the minimum investment numbers we've heard have now been raised to $150,000. Take that times a thousand people. And you're talking about a lot of money coming in and really helping the economy because all that goes into that circular engine of just more goods and services that make more construction, that makes more goods and services. It just fuels more and more. So it's very positive in, in most aspects. And it takes these empty properties off the market or shuffles people around so that instead of it being just an empty spot or a dangerous spot, a place without lights, it becomes a lit place, a place that's being maintained things get better and better. It's not just the money coming in, but it is the active use of the environment that improves as well. I hear wild animals. By the way, I'm walking through Parque Arlencio, which is gorgeous. I don't know why I don't walk here more often. We should do more videos out here because it's such a great spot. They close at 5 p.m. So we've only got a few minutes before they actually close up here. So what Nicaragua really needs, the thing that would benefit it most, of course, is simply a growing economy, right? More companies, more investment, but you know, in a real tangible sense, what they need is more people like you guys who live in my little GoPro to stop living in my little GoPro and actually come to Nicaragua, either as tourists and simply spend some tourism dollars and get the word out about what a great country it is, but even more so if some of you considered becoming expats or digital nomads and coming here and making a long-term investment to the country where you're potentially buying property, helping to take empty houses off of the market and helping to uh, improve lots and, and maybe even build new things and invest in uh, whatever it is you may be investing in here, just spending your lives here, you know, going out to eat, going to see live shows, drinking the beer, eating the food, whatever, hiring drivers to take you around. Those things do so much for the economy. That's where the real benefits come from. And there's so far, so ridiculously far from a real fear that we could ever encourage too many people to come here. That's just that we could have a really isolated impact. For example, if we went to San Juan del Sur, where there's already kind of a, an enclave, and we said, this is the spot, and we encouraged a few thousand people to move into San Juan del Sur, which would be very hard to do, but it could be done in theory. That would have a very noticeable impact on culture that would shift major parts of 
that really small area and make the way that it feels, the way the way that people perceive it would potentially change. So that is something you do have to be careful of to some really small degree. But I can't imagine even this channel and all the others that are in, the, it, mine's up here in Leon, very far away, but the ones that there's many of them down in San Juan del Sur, even if they were all wildly successful and got everybody into San Juan del Sur, you'd be like, okay, yeah, there's a few extra people, right? Would it completely change the flavor of the place? No. Would it cause major economic problems? No. Would it raise the prices down there? Barely. 10%, 20% at most, which is noticeable, but it would not be crippling. And it would create a lot more jobs and it would give the locals a little bit more buying power. They would see a diminish in their buying power, but not by anywhere near as much as the increases by. So it really wouldn't be that bad. When we're looking at the entire country, this giant country of millions of people, they're saying, well, right now they have this problem that there's the opposite effect. This is outflow of people, this outflow of jobs. And so the thing that you wanna to do to maintain the things that you love about Nicaragua, to maintain the availability of nice restaurants, to maintain the ability of services and stuff to stay here, we actually need more investment. The very thing that people is, that are worried about happening, they're doing the opposite effect because we have too few. Right now, we're on the other side of the, of the, of the divide. We don't have a surplus and we're like adding more to it and being like, oh, can it absorb a few more. No, we have this vacuum of there just isn't enough tourists. There aren't enough expats. There aren't enough visitors to, to be at that healthy desired level. So we need more. So if you're worried about doing what's good for the country, don't worry about too many people finding out about it. Worry about too few. If you're worried that you coming to Nicaragua are going to have a negative impact. Well, yeah, if you're bringing a bad attitude, sure. If you're coming down to commit crimes, sure. But if you're coming down to honestly be a good member of society and live in Nicaragua and invest and live and, and love being here and not try to cause problems, and you want the kind of people who are worried, honestly, that coming here is going to be problematic, are exactly the people we want to come here. So if that's a feeling you're having, thank you for having that feeling. For sure, thank you for taking that into consideration. That's amazing. Real quick, we're just gonna point out, this is the zoological gardens. That's the zoo, Arlen CU. And these, all of this is the parks of, of the Arlen CU park system here in Leon, which Leonesas know really well, but the rest of us are like, where's that? I don't know where that is. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful park grounds up here. They do such a great job. Um, I wish more people were aware that there's this really great park system in Sutiava. Um, and I'm gonna swing around to just show like, You know, they're closing in a few minutes here and it's raining. So there's nobody here, but there's playground after playground and beautiful sidewalks and no traffic and like uh, basketball courts and soccer fields and a zoo. And just, and there's um, on the other side of all this, like kind of back there is the uh, Unan, the university, the big university here in town. Uh, their arboretum is back there. So there's, it's a forest, but it's a control with trails and stuff uh, meant for the public. And uh, it really, it's a beautiful spot. I don't know, I think it, this is designed for like bicycles to go around. It has like these little tiny roads. It's very interesting. Anyway, so Nicaragua really appreciates everyone who is worried about doing the wrong thing. But when you stop and take a moment and ponder what doing the wrong thing would be, what would be actually good to do, the answer you come up with should be, if I want to make the most positive impact on Nicaragua as a country to make the most positive impact on the individuals, the, the Nicaraguenses who live in Nicaragua. You want to make the, do the least damage and actively do the best possible help to the country. Well, donating all of your money to it is clearly a really good thing to do, but short of something completely crazy, moving down and, and considering becoming an expat, considering making this home or making it your, your vacation home, a part-time home, but you do more good when it's a full-time home, both because you spend more money, you spend more time, you do more things to turn the economic gears, but also because you will almost certainly, there's exceptions, but almost certainly you will become more culturally integrated and that is actually the biggest fear, is that as you start to approach those other things, right, as you, this will happen long before we have enough people buying houses, long before we have enough jobs, the number of foreigners will potentially, especially if they're all coming from the US and Canada, so it's kind of a big unified group, 
they will start to bring an enclave culture with them, and that's a negative. It's not as huge a negative like Costa Rica, but it is a negative. And so that's where we can avoid that, though. You can avoid that by, instead of behaving like you're in an enclave, working to integrate into society. And that doesn't mean stopping speaking English or whatever you speak, probably English because you watch my show. It doesn't mean not eating foods from North America. It doesn't mean like giving up everything in your lifestyle, but it does mean going to the pulperia to buy your milk. It does mean shopping at the local stores, dealing with the local tailor, having shoes made locally, going to the local mall, and instead of bringing every last thing in from outside through Nika Box, doing things like in Nicaragua and having local furniture made for yourself, going out to the local bars, hanging out with local people, making local friends and participating in their society rather than inviting them to participate in yours. Not that you don't want to not participate, like for sure, introduce them to things from other places. They appreciate that. That's not bad. But instead of creating a bubble around yourself where it's here's me and my little bit of North America or my little bit of Europe or whatever, coming and being I'm going to naturally have a bubble around me because I am an expat, but as much as possible, how can I make friends and, and go out and do things with Nicaraguans and, and find cultural groups and activities where I can blend in, whether it's just daily shopping or it's your whole lifestyle. The more you do that, I'm not trying to pressure anybody and I'm not trying to make you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to do this. It's not what I mean, but the more that you try to become a part of Nicaragua, the more that you embrace it, rather than say, well, okay, I'm gonna to move to Nicaragua, but how do I make it more like America? And sometimes you need to do that. Like no one is generally prepared to make the 100% leap. Both feet first, no time, you know, cold turkey, I'm Nicaraguan, I'm gonna, you know, speak English all day and then boom, Welcome to Nicaragua, I'm only gonna speak Spanish, I'm only gonna eat gallo pinto, and you know, I'm only gonna go drink Tonya, and overnight change your entire life. If that's what you wanna do, go for it. But no one's expecting that, right? That would be a lot, And uh, but over time, making the effort and saying, I'm gonna do the local things. I'm gonna cheer for the local team and not my team back home. I'm going to go to a baseball game instead of an American football game. I'm going to uh, eat a hot dog with mayonnaise on it instead of mustard. Yeah, they do that. Uh, you know, little things and becoming another piece of the beautiful Nicaraguan experience instead of trying to change it, trying to participate in it, that, just putting in that effort, right? Again, like on one side you're concerned, like how can I do good for the country? How can I avoid doing bad for the country? By thinking that way, that's how you do it, right? You're thinking right. Now you're thinking right, here's the things you need to know. Don't worry about that. People are trying to trick you into not coming, whether they just wanna keep it cheap for themselves or they want to actively hurt the country. Don't listen to them, right? But always be conscientious. Certainly pride yourself on caring about the culture, caring about the people here. Bring that attitude here, but bring it here, right? Do more good here. Bring a good attitude here. It's gonna go a really long way. And when you do that, not only are you gonna be a happier person, I moved to a place where it didn't just hurt, not hurt them, I'm making a positive impact every day. I go out to eat and I, I'm, making, I'm, I'm helping create jobs. Whether it's the people on the farms picking the, the fruit, whether it's the person in the kitchen preparing it, the chef, the, the, the chef who's preparing it, the, the waiter who's bringing it to the table, the restaurateur who's investing in the restaurant, all those things, like I'm making all those things happen by being here and, and just eating the local food, going to the local places. You know, I, I bought a house that was otherwise gonna be empty. I turned a block that was half empty into mostly full. I made a positive difference. Come and do that with this great attitude of I want to be a positive influence. I am being a positive economic influence. Now I wanna be a positive cultural influence and be a happy participant and exciting, excited participant in Going out to the local, you know, I say it all the time, we go out to live music all the time. Go out and support the bands. Man, not everyone likes doing that, but find your niche, right? For us, yeah, we love the live music. We're putting a huge effort into supporting. Yeah, we have lots of friends who do it, so it, you know, it fuels itself. But we're having a great time. We're, we're taking our, instead of watching Netflix at night, we go out and do live events in Nicaragua. That's helping everybody, right? It's getting other people excited to do things. It's getting you guys knowledgeable about things. It's getting us happy. Our friends are getting more people. The restaurants get more business. Everybody's winning because we're integrating happily. That, that attitude of wanting to do a good job and that attitude of doing it happily that's what's gonna make the difference. That's what's gonna give that positive impact. Once you're doing that, 
just hop on that plane and come down here and bring that positivity with you. Bring that attitude with you. This is where we need it. Nicaragua is ready for more happy people that want to make a positive difference to be here. There is no reasonable fear that Nicaragua is for hundreds of years ever going to face the kinds of problems that are in Costa Rica and currently face an opposite set of problems that will be solved very easily by getting the word out and making people aware that the things they wish Costa Rica was is what Nicaragua is and is going to be into the future. Those things, those things that you desire, that beautiful environment, wonderful people, cheap prices, affordable houses, tons of options, beaches, mountains, nature, wonderful people, live music, Spanish, Gallo Pinto. Yes, Costa Rica has them, but Nicaragua has all of them better. Come down and experience it for yourself with a really wonderful attitude that people on my show just naturally have because that's kind of the vibe of this show. We're the happy, make it good difference kind of Nicaragua show. Make it happen. I'm looking forward to meeting more of you and at least one of you is gonna be showing up by the time this goes live. I will be just 48 hours away from, from meeting someone else in person who's coming down and I got like three people that I'm meeting in the next week or two. Thanks for joining me. I will see all of you tomorrow.